I am quite pleased to introduce N. Scott Mamaday. His work celebrates and preserves Native American oral tradition and art. His first novel, House Made of Dawn, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1969. Since then, he has published more than a dozen works, including novels, children's stories, poetry, essays, and a memoir. In the mid-1970s, Mr. Mamaday took up drawing and painting. His art has been exhibited widely in the United States, and his drawings and etchings illustrate his more recent books. Raised first on the Kiowa Indian Reservation in Oklahoma, and then in Arizona, where he was exposed to the Navajo, Apache, and Pueblo Indian cultures of the Southwest, Mr. Mamaday developed an abiding interest in literature, especially poetry. After graduating from the University of New Mexico, he won a poetry fellowship to Stanford University's Creative Writing Program, earning a doctorate in English literature in 1963. He then taught at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and at UC Berkeley, where he was professor of English and comparative literature, and also designed a graduate program of Indian studies. Mr. Mamaday also taught for years at the University of Arizona. He received the first Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas and was awarded the National Medal of Arts in 2007. He was the Oklahoma Centennial State Poet Laureate from July 2007 to January 2009. But today, most importantly, he's been a long-standing friend uh, and supporter of St. John's College, a wonderful member of our community who is currently serving as artist and residence for the college. Uh, that began this spring, and Mr. Mamaday led several uh, wonderful study groups with our students and faculty on Dickinson, Joyce, Wallace Stevens, some paintings, and, and other things this spring. Uh, we're very happy to have him speaking this summer, and we have scheduled a lecture this fall, or a talk this fall, on Halloween. We're hoping Mr. Mamaday will, uh, will distract us from us. <laughs> Uh, and I'd just like to point out that uh, we have a packed house today for many reasons, but one part of that is our Summer Academy uh, students. We bring groups of uh, high school students here in the summer for week-long immersion programs uh, at the college. And we have a group this week uh, doing readings and classes uh, and events around the theme, the American Experiment. So when Mr. Mamaday was scheduled to talk, it was with the idea that there be a connection with what those folks are doing here this week. It's unusual at St. John's for us in the classroom to read an author who we then might meet and talk to. And the Summer Academy students are having that uh, rare experience this week. They've looked at uh, some of his poetry in the context of their study of the American experiment. So all of that said, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mamaday. Mamaday is going to speak for about 30 minutes, and then, unlike our normal practice, I think we'll go straight in to some questions and conversation. People can leave gracefully if they'd like, but we won't take a break. We'll just go right into that when you're ready. Okay? Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I see some people standing around. I'm sorry that you don't have seats. Um, but I won't be long, so <laughs> um, I brought some things that I would like to share with you. <clears throat> but, and the first thing I want to share is a, a prose poem called <coughs> The Poet in Love. Now, I am a poet, and uh, <clears throat> I spent a good deal of time writing poetry. And uh, one day I decided that I would try to to describe the experience in a prose poem. I find that writing a poem is like falling in love. There is a fierce excitement to it. It is mysterious and deliciously dangerous. It's the most intimate kind of courtship. Each syllable, each word, each line is something of your lover discovered. You want to give wholly and unconditionally of yourself, and you cannot give enough. Your suffering is exquisite. You think you will die of delight. 
then you reach a plateau and ecstasy becomes a calm and serene contentment. The giddy part of the honeymoon is over and you settle into a constant, seamless state of bliss. You know you're heading and the wind is ever in your sails and at last you reach your destination and there is no satisfaction like it. The prize has been won, the dream come true, the marriage consummated, you are in, you've earned the rest of your life. <laughs> you have that. Now, um, because I am familiar with Native American oral tradition, uh, I have a very great respect for the imagery and the melodies of uh, Native American song. Uh, we don't have poetry in that tradition as, as uh, poetry is generally defined. By the way, let's define poetry before we go on telling you. I don't know how you think of it, um, and I'm not sure that there is one definition or that, or that the one definition is, is uh, that any one definition is capable of expressing what a poem is. The, the, the best definition I have come across is this. A poem is a statement concerning the human condition composed in verse, and it's that last that last uh, element that is crucial, verse. Verse is measure, and poetry is composed in measure. That is, traditional poetry is composed in measure. And so uh, the English traditional forms are well known to some of you I know. We all are familiar with the term iambic pentameter, which seems to be the basic unit in uh, English poetry. Um, but more and more, I think, people are are, are verging away from that traditional form and creating new forms. There, you know, there is a, there is the term free verse, which is a con uh, contradiction in terms. I think, nonetheless, it does exist, and you can open the pages of the New Yorker and see that uh, you know the, the old idea of verse is uh, not as relevant as it once was. But the Indian, the the uh, the Native American oral tradition has very definite units of uh, verse, of measure, uh, different from what you may be used to, but they're very beautiful. And some of you know those things. One of the uh, great poems in that tradition, or songs in that tradition, is the night chant, a house made of dawn, a house made of evening light, a house made of dark cloud. It's a very beautiful kind of expression. Anyway, this, this uh, is uh, related to, to that to tradition, and it's called Prayer for Words. My voice restore for me, that's from the Navajo night chant. Here is the wind bending the reeds westward, the patchwork of morning on gray moraine. Had I words, I could tell of origin of God's hands bloody with birth at first light, of my thin squeals in the heat of his breath, of the taste of bee, the bitterness and sense of camas root and choke cherries. And God, if my mute heart expresses me, I am the rolling thunder and the bursts of torrents upon rock, the whispering of old leaves the essence of deep canyons, I am the rattle of mortality. I could tell of the splintered sun, I could articulate the night sky, had I words. Now, um, going on with that tradition, for a moment, uh, I am a bear. There's a whole story to that. I'm not sure I have time to tell you about it. But I am a bear because of my name. Uh, my my uh, Kiowa name is Tsoai Tali, which means rock tree boy. And I'm named for the uh, monolith in Wyoming that's, that is uh, 
commonly known as Devil's Tower. And there is a story about how Devil's Tower came to be, and it involves a bear. It involves a boy who turns into a bear. And I am the reincarnation of that boy because of my name. Bears are very important to me. I write about bears quite a bit. And I have a book called In the Bear's House, which is all about bears, including my illustrations of bears, drawings, paintings. Well, this, this boy, or this, yes, this boy, I'll call it a boy, is uh, to an aged bear. So you can see it's quite autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> Hold hard this infirmity. It defines you. You are old. Now fix yourself in summer in thickets of ripe berries and venture towards the ridge where you were born. Await there the setting sun. Be alive to that old conflagration one more time. Mortality is your shadow and your shade. Translate yourself to spirit. Be present on your journey. Keep to the trees and waters. Be the singing soil. I'm an artist too, and as a painter, visual artist, and uh, I'm very fond of uh, this landscape. I think of New Mexico as my native land, though I was born in Oklahoma. Came to New Mexico when I was a year old, or, or even less than a year old. So I grew up in uh, New Mexico and Arizona, uh, have traveled widely uh, in my adult years. Um, circumnavigated the globe, lived in interesting places like Germany and Russia. And, uh, but I always think of this, this place as the center of the world. And uh, so did Georgia O'Keeffe, as you may know. She loved the light of New Mexico as I do. And uh, it, I don't know other light like it. It's uh, wonderful for artists. Come close to it in uh, Uzbekistan, or yes, in Uzbekistan. Um, Central Asia has great light, uh, but but here there is something very special about the landscape and the colors of the earth here. And uh, in, in the early 70s, I was here on leave from the University of California at Berkeley, and I was spending a sabbatical here. And in that uh, year of 1972. I received an invitation from George O'Keefe to visit her at Abiquiu. I drove up there on a cold February afternoon, and I was trembling with the anticipation of meeting this great artist whose work I very much admire, and still do, of course. But uh, here I had the opportunity to meet her face to face and to talk to her, to engage in conversation with George O'Keefe, for goodness sake. <laughs> So I got out of my car, and I went up to the door, and I knocked. And George O'Keefe opened the door. She was wearing a tuxedo. She affected the wearing of black and white. And her beautiful gray hair was like actually silver hair, was drawn severely back. She had beautiful, large artist's hands. Come in, come in, please. Oh. I walked in and we started talking. She, she started showing me around the, the, the room where we, the, the, the living room. And there were paintings on the walls that she had recently finished. They were her rock paintings, as she called them. She, she was already in her 80s. And um, there were wonderful objects of art in the room, uh, including bones, you know, the skulls of cows and sheep, and the skeleton of a snake in a glass box. She showed me the, the, the adobe fireplace that she had built with her own hands. And uh, she had window boxes full of rocks, stones. She loved to go out in the arroyos and collect beautiful stones. She had boxes full of them. Well, we engaged in conversation, and uh, I found her to be 
Oh, so learned and uh, her, her mind so curious. And I was having a hard time keeping up with her, in fact. But at a certain point in the conversation, it occurred to George O'Keefe that she had neglected to offer me refreshment. <laughs> and so she got kind of flustered, you know, and she said, oh dear, what would you like to drink? And I couldn't have cared less. You know, and I said, please don't bother, I'm having a wonderful time. But she had got it into her head that I was going to have a drink. <laughs> and so, she persisted, and I, I said something, you know, oh, I'll have, a, I'll have a scotch and soda or something like that. And she nodded and absented herself. She went out in the direction of the kitchen, and she did not return. <laughs> <laughs> I sat there <laughs> and waited and waited and waited. I began to be concerned. What has happened to this uh, elderly woman? You know, is she is she in trouble? Uh, does she need help? Should I go and investigate, or that, would that only embarrass her? And uh, then, to make matters worse, there came from the kitchen banging of like pots and pans <laughs> banging together. That really disturbed me. But she did not return, and uh, this went on for a long time. I cannot tell you how uneasy I was. Uh, then she returned. But she was more flustered than ever. And she said, oh dear, it's my maid's day off, and I don't know what she did with the key to the liquor pantry. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so relieved to see her. You know, I, I said, oh, please, please, don't, uh, don't concern yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm having a wonderful time. I'm glad you were you're, uh, Back and, you know, <laughs> but no, no, she she uh, she absented herself again. Went out in the direction of the kitchen and did not return. And I sat there and waited and waited and waited. Again, the banging of pots and pans, and uh, I began to be really concerned. You know, I developed. Beads of blood appeared on my forehead. <laughs> tick, which I still have. <laughs> Just as I was about to expire, she returned with my drink on a silver tray. <laughs> it turns out that this octogenarian, this great artist, George O'Keefe, had taken the pantry doors off at the hinges and the screwdriver. <laughs> of the earth at Abigail, and other times that followed from the one, an easy contrivance of stories and late luncheons of wine and cheese. All around there were beautiful objects, clean and precise in their beauty, like bone. Indeed, bone, a snake in the filaments of bone, the skulls of cows and sheep, and the many smooth stones in the window, in the flat winter light, were beautiful. I wanted to feel the sun in the stones, the ashen, far-flung winter sun. And then in those days, too, I made you the gift of a small brown stone, and you described it with the tips of your fingers, and knew at once that it was beautiful. At once, accordingly, you knew, as you knew the forms of the earth at Abigail, that time involves them, and they bear away beautiful, various, remote, in failing light, and the coming of cold. On the day she died, I was giving a reading at Bucknell University. I got word before I read. And I happened to have this part with me, so I read it uh, on that occasion and was so glad that I had it because it meant to me a kind of commemorative um, 
And so there you have that. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be very jealous of my time because I want to answer some questions if you have them. So let me read a poem called A Benign Self-Portrait. It is a recent poem. And uh, that's, that's all I'll say about it. I'll just read it. A Benign Self-Portrait. A mirror will suffice, no doubt, the high furrowed forehead, the heavy lidded Asian eyes, the long lobed Indian ears, brown skin beginning to spot, of an age to bore and be bored. I turn away knowing too well my face, my expression for all seasons, my half smile. Birds flit about the feeder, the dog days wane, and I observe the jitters of leaves and the pallor of the ice blue beyond. I turn, I read to find inspiration, I write to restore candor to the mind. There are raindrops on the window, and the peregrine wind gusts on the grass. I think of my old red flannel shirt, the one I threw away in July. I would like to pat the warm belly of a beagle or the hand of a handsome woman. I look ahead to cheese and wine and a bit of Bach, perhaps, of Schumann of the bow of Yo-Yo Ma. I see the mountains as I saw them when my heart was young. But were they not deeper blue, shimmering <coughs> under the icy blue of skies, radiant with crystal light? Ah, across the way, the yellow land lies out, and standing stones form distant islands in the field of time. There is stillness on this perfect world, and I am content to settle in its hold. I turn inward to a, ball of, to a wall of books. They are old friends, even those that have dislodged my dreams. One by one, they have shaped the thing I am. These are the days that swarm into the shadows of legend. I ponder, and when the image on the glass is refracted into the prisms of the past, I shall remember my parents speaking quietly in a warm, familiar room, and I bend to redeem an errant, broken doll. My little daughter, her eyes brimming with love, beholds the ember of my soul. There is the rattle of a teacup, and in the window and among the vines, the whir of a hummingbird's wing. In the late evening, in another room, there is the faint laughter of ghosts. And in a tarnished silver frame, the likeness of a boy who bears my name. Even a more recent poem, and I'll end with this one, I think. Uh, this poem that is very recent, just a few days old, actually. And it's called Landsman. Landsman. It's a sonnet in, in heroic couplets, if you know what that means. When I am something of this tarnished land, I'm sorry, burnished. When I am something of this burnished land, my mind is buoyant on the rippled sand. Mirages shimmer on the road ahead, and in deceit the smoking air lies dead. The light shines like bone. Evening stands away, and scorpions invest the cracks in clay. A form, a, st a storm of bats obscures the burning rim 
the loss of day remarks the interim. All shadows dissolve in the pool of night, and images fade in the end of sight. Here is the cold cell of mortality, the seed and fossil of eternity. In dark the constellations pulse and gleam, and I am something of the landsman's dream. Well, uh, let me ask you if you have any, any questions. I'll give you a moment to compose them. And, uh, there's a hand at the very back, yes. Painting right now. Painting right now. What am I painting? Yeah. Um, I'm painting a portrait, and I don't much like it. <laughs> it's a large uh, canvas, and uh, it's black. It's a black background with a white face. I like portraits. I've uh, painted a number of portraits, and uh, so this is one. And I have no idea what it will become. I don't like it at the moment, and I'm wondering if I can save it. <laughs> I don't know. The, the, problem, the problem with uh, revising a painting is that you, you, know, you can paint over a, a, an image, that, that's fine, and then you can paint over that, and then you can paint over that, and pretty soon you've got too damn much paint on the canvas. <laughs> it's ruined. So I have an idea that that's the risk I'm running with this case. I was in Russia in the 70s, 1974. I went to Russia to teach at the University of Russia, the University of Moscow. And uh, I, there was something about uh, being there in that strange country and something about my isolation that caused me to begin drawing. Uh, my father was a painter, and I had grown up watching him paint, and I had not, no desire to become a painter myself. Uh, my mother was a writer, and I followed in her footsteps. I decided that I wanted to be a writer. But something about that Russian experience turned me towards painting, and I had learned a great deal from my father by osmosis. You know, I had watched him paint, I had uh, seen what he could do, there I was, a uh, distance from it, and with no desire to paint. Then suddenly I was overcome with this, this uh, desire to draw, and the drawing became painting and printmaking, and so it opened up a new career to me. And uh, my first exhibit was uh, a collection of shields, Plains Indian shields I painted. And uh, then I started uh, working with Indian motifs, uh, and uh, then finally into portraits. I'm not a landscape artist. Uh, looking at some of George O'Keefe's work, I wish I could be a landscape artist, but I haven't come to that as yet anyway. Next question. Yes. Um, in your that poem you just read, the second to the last, the um, benign self-portrait, mm -hmm. um, you had a line in there that you said, and I didn't hear it, and I, I would like to hear it. it. You said, I read to something and I write to something. Could you read that to me? Yeah, I, I, I read to something. <laughs> Maybe I did hear it. And I write, to, I, wrote, I write to restore candor to the mind. Candor, okay. Candor, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, and... I, and now you've got me curious. Yeah, me too. Candor, restore candor. Well... I read to find inspiration. Okay. I write to restore candor to the mind. Okay. Thank Isn't you. Isn't that shameful that I can't remember? <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. 
You know, I, I was telling my wife just the other day that uh, an interesting, I had an inter interesting experience when I was teaching at uh, in California. I, I accepted a post. I was first at the University of California, Santa Barbara. That was my first teaching post. And then I switched from English to comparative literature, and I took a post at Berkeley. And there was a little party to welcome me to Berkeley one evening. And I went there, and uh, there was a man named Roy Bundy who taught at Berkeley. And he was a fascinating man. Um, I had a neighbor at Santa Barbara who knew Bundy and has told me before I went to Berkeley, he said, you know you're going to meet Roy Bundy. And Roy Bundy is a Pindaric scholar. And he has written 19 pages on Pindar. That's all. But no Pindaric scholar in the world can afford not to read those 19 pages. <laughs> and so he came very highly recommended to me. And I, I met him at this party. And uh, I had written Housemaid of Dawn, and I had received a prize. And um, I was known as a novelist. I suppose I still am. But I, I started talking to him, and he said, why are you writing novels? <laughs> You're a poet. Why aren't you writing poetry? You know, how, how, you, how you react to someone. <laughs> and, then, and then he started reciting my poems to me. And he knew them better than I did. I was a, it was a strange experience. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, I read to find inspiration. <laughs> I write to restore character. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Any memories you can share about Wallace Stegner and studying uh, Stanford with him? Yes. Wallace Stegner was the head of creative writing at Stanford when I went there, and I, the, the scholarship, the, the fellowship that I won was called the Wallace Stegner Fellowship. But he was teaching uh, fiction, of course. He was, a, he, was a, he was a fine writer of fiction and prose. He was not a poet. Well, I was a poet, and uh, I, so I studied under Ivor Winters, who headed the poetry program at Stanford. But I remember Wallace Stegner with great affection. He was a very fine man, and uh, he and I got along quite well. Uh, we became friends. And when I won the Pulitzer Prize, he sent me a telegram. Uh, and uh, I, I was then in Santa Barbara. And, he, and that, was, uh, that touched me deeply, and I appreciated that. So when he won the Pulitzer, I sent him a telegram. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I have fond memories of Wallace Stegner. Of course, Paige lives here now, his son. And uh, I see him very occasionally, but uh, he's, he's also a writer. Other questions? Yes? Yes, yes. Doctor. Uh, your discussion about uh, uh, the painting that you're working on now and, and the struggle that you're having with it, I wonder if you could speak to the subject of uh, critics and curators uh, who like to know the intent behind a piece of art as if it were full grown in your mind before you began. Well, I can, I can say that I very rarely have a complete idea of the painting when I start it. Um, I, I, a lot of it is experimental. Uh, I was once talking to uh, uh, Fritz Scholler, and, and uh, I asked him, I don't remember, he didn't ask me, he volunteered this information. He said, you know how I begin a painting? And I said, how? And he said, I put color on the canvas. I cover the canvas with color. I have no idea what it's going to become. But once I have done that, you know, it's a, it's a start. I can, I can follow up on that and produce something. So it is the same, um, it, it is the same with me, I think. It's also true of writing, you know. I, uh, I, I can't write a poem without beginning with a word or a line. And once I have that, I can build on it something to build upon. So 
Yeah, I don't, don't, don't usually have a complete idea of what, what uh, I want the thing, the poem, or the painting to become when I started. It's a work in progress. Yes, my friend. Scott, I want to thank you uh, for coming here. And I was very happy to, to, to know and to see you again. Uh, I brought my class with me, but we have to go back and finish it now. <laughs> well, Simon, thanks so much for coming. It's good to see you. Scott, yeah, I always, I will always admire and love you. Thank you. <laughs> What's Sarah doing? Uh, she's up in Seattle. She's working for the Seattle Public School System. Okay. Give her yeah. my best. I, I will. I will. Thank you for bringing the class. Right. I've never gone and removed the audience from Simon. <laughs> something I said about uh, concentration, that when you write, you must be fully concentrated on what you're doing. Painting is a little different. I can listen to music and paint. Can't do that with writing. So it's a, it is an isolated, lonely process. Uh, but, but there is a, I once heard, a, I once heard a, an interview with a writer interviewer ask that obligatory question, is it difficult to write? <laughs> and the, the, the writer said, oh no, oh no, 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 there's nothing to it. All you do is put a sheet of paper in the machine, you can tell how old this is. <laughs> put a piece of paper in the machine and, and then you wait until beads of blood do appear on your phone. <laughs> That simple. It's hard work, but, but as I like to say, um, there's no satisfaction. Well, maybe there's one. <laughs> but there are very few satisfactions that are equal to, to doing what you think you can do in a given space of time. Uh, William Gass was once asked who he wrote for. Who do you write for? And he said, well, I don't write for myself. That would be self-serving. And I don't write for an audience that would be pandering. Mm. I write for the thing that is trying to be born. Mm. And I, I, I like that answer. That it seems to me that's the way it ought to be. You know, when you're in a room with your computer or typewriter or pat and pencil, by yourself, you know, it's a great, uh, it's a great test of your integrity. I think to write something. And you know, you you do. Um, uh, Will and Ariel Durant, who wrote all those big tomes of history, you know, they wrote their, their quota. Their, they wrote 250 words a day. That doesn't seem like much, but look what they ended up with. You know? <laughs> um, and so I have something of that kind of quota in mind each day if I go to my study and uh, want to write something. I say, well, I'm going to write uh, 200 words today. I'm going to write a paragraph instead. And if I do that, if I keep to my intention, I'm satisfied. And if you write something, you know, you can look at the blank page until beads of blood do appear on your forehead. And that's, there's no frustration. It's worse than that. But when you do write something down and you understand that it is the best thing you could have done with that, with the time you have, that's a great satisfaction. That's a redemption. Yes, another question. Yes, over here. You, you in New Mexico, as your native land, 
If New Mexico's nickname was not the land of enchantment, what would you want it to be? Is New Mexico what I want it to be? No. Uh, you view New Mexico as your native land. Yes. If its nickname was not the land of enchantment, what would you want it to be? What would I want the name to be? The nickname, if, it, if its nickname was not the land of enchantment. My golly, I've never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> about God's gift to me. <laughs> yes. Back, back. There's been a wonderful outpouring of indigenous literature in the past 45 years since you won the Pulitzer. I wonder if you can share your hopes for the next 45 years. Um, Maybe not only for indigenous writers, but for critics of indigenous literature as well. Yes, I, I think I would agree with what you're saying. There has been a tremendous burst of energy on the part of indigenous literature in the last few years. When I published House Made of Dawn, um, uh, Bury My Heart and Wounded Knee was it appeared at about the same time. It seems to me that those two books really made a difference in, in, in uh, the general attitude towards native writing and native history. Um, so that was a breakthrough. And uh, it has continued. Many, many more Native American people are writing today, and some of them are writing extremely well. And I think that will keep up and uh, become stronger as it goes. Um, and I think an interesting thing is happening to poetry generally. I, I, I can't tell you the name of the recent uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. He's an Indian, I think, uh, East India, a native of India. But uh, I was listening to an interview with him the other day, and. He's, he made the remark that, oh, poetry is a lot, not only a liar, well, it is burgeoning. It is, um, it is truly, you know, truly there and growing. And I, I think he's right, and I'm delighted about that, because a few years ago, I think poetry was, was rather, uh, had been diminished in America, it was not appreciated as it was elsewhere in the world. At the time I went to Russia, I was, I was so greatly impressed by how the Russians thought of poetry and how they, you, you'd see people on the metro with books of poetry, and when there was a reading, public reading, it was held in a stadium, and there was standing room only. And uh, that, that was greatly exhilarating to me, it was inspiring. And I think we're not, we're not to that stage yet, but I think poetry is, has not only survived, but it has uh, it has uh, prevailed in recent times. And who knows what the future will be? Who knows what the future will be of books as we know them? Oh, they're disappearing. <laughs> yes. Uh, <clears throat> I've been very moved by your writings of the land and your feeling for the land and for nature is. Do you have, is that your main source of inspiration? It's a great source. I, I love the landscape, as I said, and I find inspiration in it. But I find inspiration all over the place. Um, I find a good deal of my inspiration comes from reading poetry. Uh, when I read poetry, I want to write it. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing, you know. Um, I was just uh, looking into one of my old colleagues at Stanford, uh, Thomas, uh, Tom Gunn, whose, uh, whose work I admire very much. And I read some of his work periodically. I'll pick up a book by him and I'll look at it. And I'll see something that I had not seen before and it will inspire me. And that's true of uh, you know many poets that I have in my library. Uh, they're a constant source of inspiration. So inspiration comes from all sides and it's all the time. Yes, sir. How much of the narration for the piece, uh, the PBS piece on the Hamas, did you write? Did you just, uh, the, the piece with you and Meryl Streep? 
Yes, I think I think um, the, the man who made that film is an interesting man, and he's a great filmmaker. I've done several narrations from his work, and that one uh, I think was pretty much composed of my own writing. I, I narrated from my own words, uh, and the and the uh, the <coughs> the uh, aggravating thing is that Merrill and I did did it separately. And I've never met her. Aww. So, but I, I can always say, oh yes, uh, Meryl Street and I narrated that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, behind you, you know, sir. I, I was going to ask you about your experience with the evil winters, and I was paid by the great admirer of Tom Gunn myself, uh -huh. and I, I really was interested in what your recollection of the country is, your experience with him, and uh, would you? He's such an interesting, I guess, controversial man in some ways. Yes, yes. Ivor Winters was, uh, was was controversial, but it was because he was he he was um, he had the strength of his own conviction, and he was not afraid to speak out, you know, and to tell you what he was thinking. He could write things that just aggravated people terribly. <coughs> he he could write. The less said about Emerson, the better. <laughs> and that's got to offend a lot of people. <laughs> but he stood by his guns, and uh, he, he would not change his mind about him. That's, I came to admire him very much. He became a very good friend of mine, maybe one of my best friends of all time. He was bright, and he was he had this this reputation of being uh, very, you know, very. Uh, Oh, what's the word? He aggravated people. But he was a uh, teddy bear at the same time. He, he was very gentle inside himself. And I got you know, to know both sides of him, of course. And, and uh, I think he was one of the most influential people in my life. And I admired him and uh, still do. He did, uh, you know, he had some wonderful poets. Uh, I've just been reading Tom Gunn, as, as I said. Uh, J.B. Cunningham, do you know his work? Yes. Yeah, he was a good friend of Winters and came to Stanford to read while I was there. And uh, I, I admire his work very much. Winters managed to produce, uh, or encourage, I'm not sure produce is the right word, he encouraged some, some very uh, uh, notable writers. It's an interesting and influential man. Yes? Is inspiration opposed to candor? In that line, yes, there are lines right. the lady hopefully brought our attention to. Yes. I don't know how to distinguish those things. They're, they're equal in my mind. Inspiration is, is uh, I think, uh, indispensable. But so is candor uh, to a writer. So I don't, I wouldn't put one above the other. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> Doctor, can you name the three poets who you find most inspirational and you go back to the family? You know, if you had to have three on yourself and you just pull them out. What was the question? The question is, if I, if, can I name three, who, who are the three poets or writers that I place uh, at the top of the list? Um, certainly, um, Emily Dickinson, Wallace Stevens, those, those come very easily to mind. I don't know about the third. That's more difficult. You know, I, I have this overwhelming admiration for Shakespeare, which is expected of us all. <laughs> but to tell you the truth, uh, his lyrics I don't care for as much as I do his uh, tragedies. The King Lear is one of the great things in, in world literature. And I don't begin to understand how a person like uh, Shakespeare can come to be. It staggers the imagination. It only happened once in a very long time. <laughs> what else? Any other questions? I think we might be thinking of ending here. Mm -hmm. Yes. 